I believe you're on. Okay. Oh, now I need to drop my slideshow again. My computer is just moving in slow-mo. Okay, so this just shows a typical day of mine, adding up all my fruits and vegetables and grains and seasonings and herbs and nuts and seeds and beans that I might eat in a day. So around 30. So I really challenge you to kind of think, how many do you have in a day? Because the value to help our gut, and we're gonna go over the gut microbiome, but to have the best gut health, we need a wide diversity of plants. And you know, sometimes I know a lot of people do this, they, they find a, an eating style that works for them and then they eat the same foods, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now I'm kind of guilty of that for breakfast. I have my oatmeal every single day. So I could even vary that up by having some different foods, different berries, a different grain, different nuts. I could vary that up and then have even a wider diversity of plant foods. So I know you all know the value of plants is that they're super high in fiber and fiber is the food for the bacteria, the good bacteria in our gut. Plant foods also are very low in calories. So you get to eat a lot more for fewer calories. They're loaded with those antioxidants that help fight off disease, reduce our risk of dementia, help us to um, fight infections. So we love plant foods for the things that are in them that help protect the plant. Those also protect us. They're nutrient dense. So that means they've got lots of nutrients for a low calorie budget. So very few calories per bite is how we would think of that. They're full of these phytochemicals, some of these, those are plant chemicals, plant nutrients that can help the pump plant. They can help protect our cells. They help protect our DNA. They can help fight cancer and heart disease. They help with our brain health. So those are not things you can find in animal foods. And so the fiber in plants increases the diversity of the bacteria in your gut. So the more diverse the plants we eat, the more diverse the bacteria in our gut are. And we're gonna find out that's like the most important thing to having a good, healthy gut microbiome. So I abbreviate throughout this gut microbiome as GMB. And that is just all the little bacteria that are in our gut. So our gut weighs about four to six pounds. There's more gut bacteria than human cells in our body. So our gut microbiome has about 40 trillion um, bacteria in it, whereas human cells, we have about 30 trillion. I was just listening to somebody talk about how much 40 trillion looks like, because most of us can't wrap our head around that. So if you took all the stars in the sky and then put them in 100 galaxies of all those stars in the sky, that would be about how many gut microbiome has. That's just in our gut, in four to six pounds. To me, that's kind of amazing. Um, healthy adults have more than a thousand species, so different kinds of bacteria in our gut microbiome. And the bacterial diversity, it can vary up depending on a lot of different things. It can de depend on heredity, so heredity plays a role. It can depend on our environment. We'll learn about that a little bit. It can depend on how we were birthed. So if we were birthed through the vaginal canal, we're gonna have more bacteria in our gut than if we were a C-section. How we were fed. So if we were breastfed, we've got more gut bacteria than someone who has fed formula. How much antibiotics we might use because antibiotics kill bugs and they can't really differentiate between the good bugs and the bad bugs. And diet is a big part of it. So, and then our gut microbiome changes. I was just hearing about a study where they took people who ate meat and measured how much bacteria they had in their gut, like just a regular, normal, typical American diet. And then they had them eat change to a plant food diet for a while and in a very short period of time, 
they ended up with lots more variety and diversity in their gut microbiome. So it can change. So this is just a little picture. I it shows us which bacteria, and you just might have heard of some of these, are in which part of our colon. So we eat food, it goes to our stomach. From our stomach, it goes to the first thing there, the duodenum. Then it goes to the jejunum and the ileum. Those three things make up our small intestine, which if you spread it all out is about the size of a tennis court. If you spread it out and it's got all these little finger projections and if you flatten all those out, that's about the size of a tennis court. And then from the small intestine, things go into our large intestine, also called the colon. So the bacteria that are typically found in these areas, you can see on the right, these just a bunch of big words, but in case you have heard of these or you're wondering about them, it, we have a lot there in the end part of our small intestine, the ileum and the colon are gonna be, the colon is really where we have most of them. Okay, I'm just really having trouble with my little Turner thing, oops. Okay, so the gut microbiome has things that affect our body. It affects our body in ways that we can't even imagine. So there's actually, we have this nerve called the vagus nerve and it goes up to our brain. So what's in our gut can also affect our brain. They're finding out, and I didn't even put that here, I don't think, but if our, what's in our gut can affect our mood. But basically we eat food and the bacteria in our gut break down the fiber and create these things called short chain fatty acids. SBFA, um, butyrate is a common name of one, if you've heard of that. These things help the lining of the colon. Now, if we don't eat much fiber, these bacteria don't have any food. So then what they start to nibble on is the lining of our colon. And so then when they nibble on the lining of our colon, our colon is set so that all the little cells go really tight, they call them tight junctions, really close together. So if these bacteria start chewing on our colon, because we didn't give it any food, because we didn't need any fiber, we start to get these things, um, we get leaky and things leak out of our colon and into our system. And that's where we get problems like inflammation and increases our risk of cancer and things like that. So these, the bacteria in our gut, the gut microbiome, also protects against pathogens, against things that are gonna hurt us. So we got good bacteria, and then we have bad bacteria. You know, none of us wanna get E. coli. That's one that we've all heard of, food parts poisoning, none of us wanna get it. But we do have some in our gut, but it's kept at bay by the good bacteria. So if we end up not, getting a diversity of high fiber foods, what happens is we get less good bacteria and they've been keeping the bad bacteria down. So then we start building up more bad bacteria. Then also those bacteria educate our immune system. So our immune system starts to learn who's the good bu bugs, who's the bad bugs. So then the good bugs can help fight our immune system or help develop our immune system. Also, bacteria in our gut, and they've got all the fancy names in that picture, but they help the body get rid of these things called phenobiotics. Those are things that are not naturally found in the body. You might think of them just as toxins. It could also be things that we get exposed to in our environment, pesticides, herbicides, smog, things like that. The, gut, the good bacteria in our gut help to get rid of those. So we love that. So the gut, the bacteria in our gut help to preserve the gut lining like we already talked about. Um, and it plays a role also in making some vitamins. There's some vitamins that are made in our gut. So like vitamin, some of the vitamin B, vitamin K, and helps us with absorption, like absorbing calcium and iron. So these gut microbiome, the bacteria in the gut are super helpful to all areas of our health. Now, some of you, and this come up on questions before, you say, what about probiotics? What about prebiotics? So probiotics are actually foods that contain live bacteria. Um, 
and often it's fermented foods. So sauerkraut is a fermented food. We made it in microbiology. You can make your own at home. A um, miso is fermented soybeans. Soy sauce is fermented. Tempeh is fermented soybeans in a different um, form. And then there's yogurt. You know, people eat yogurt and they want the live cultures because those are the live bacteria that are in those yogurts. Kefir is another one. Kombucha is like a juice almost that's got the live bacteria in it. And I, kombucha came up a, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking and I'm not sure if I have another slide on it, but fermented foods are awesome because they're supplying some good bacteria, but they're not supplying a fraction of the bacteria that we get by eating high fiber foods for those good bacteria in our gut. So we don't have to really count on fermented foods. Like for me, I'm kind of sad. I don't really love any fermented foods. I wish I loved sauerkraut, I don't. I use miso once in a while. I try not to have soy sauce too much because of the salt. I do love tempeh, but I don't have it all the time. But these things are nice, but they're not necessarily the be all end all because eating a variety of whole plant foods is gonna really increase the diversity much more so. Um, the trouble with kombucha is it's super popular and they add a bunch of sugar to it so that we'll love it and then we'll buy it. And, you know, if you're replacing, I listened, listened to the podcast, the guy said, if you're replacing sodas with kombucha, that's kind of a good swap. But if you replace kombucha with water, that's an even better swap. So water still just fine. So that's probiotics. They have the bacteria. And then there's prebiotics. And those are food that actually feed the gut bacteria. They're generally foods high in fiber. There are some foods that have more prebiotic power than others. Some of the words you'll hear are, or you'll see on labels even, inulin or resistant starch. Those are things that act as prebiotic. They feed the gut bacteria, as do all of our fruits and vegetables. And then this was a new word for me. I told you about all a while ago, and if you weren't here, I'll tell you again. I have read this book called Fiber Fueled by Dr. Will Olkowitz, I think his name is, hard to pronounce. And I really learned a lot from the book. I thought it was a real good read. I got it at the library and I was tempted to buy it because it had some fun recipes in it. But I got some information from that that I'm providing you with here. So a new word that we're starting to hear is postbiotic. So if you take prebiotics, which are the food that feed the bacteria, and you add to that some probiotics, which are the, um, kind of fermented foods and stuff with the bacteria, you get postbiotics. So microbes work on the foods we eat and then they transform that food. So if we're eating good, healthy things, things that were created from healthy food, then that's gonna be good postbiotics. Unhealthy food feed the unhealthy microbes and that creates things that can cause inflammation. So another thing I heard recently is that somebody said, well, well, prebiotics feed the good and the bad bacteria. And no, by definition, the prebiotics only feed the good bacteria. So if we've got prebiotics plus probiotics, we, they create this new postbiotics and those are compounds that help our gut. Just in case you hear that new buzzword, you know, it's funny how things just start to pick up and then you're hearing them all the time. What we don't want to have is dysbiosis. Sorry, this is just, we need pretty much a dictionary for this lesson today. Dysbiosis is an imbalance of the bacteria in our gut. It's when the bad bacteria take over because we didn't have enough good bacteria. It's usually caused because we didn't eat enough fiber. So we're not feeding the good bacteria. We're not giving it anything good to eat. And so it's starting to have problems. The bad bacteria are taking over. It could be because of antibiotic use too which I um, mentioned earlier, antibiotics kill bacteria, good and bad. It could possibly contribute to inflammation and inflammation contributes to insulin resistance, meaning we might make plenty of insulin, but it's not working very well. We're fighting it. It can also be caused by over sanitizing. I'm super curious how in the last 
year and a half as we've become so much more sanitized how our gut microbes have done. I feel like in the last year and a half, we really needed a whole food plant-based diet to keep our microbiome up. Because now, I don't know, I never really used to use the hand sanitizer and all that stuff. But now, of course, we're using it all the time. But they've done some studies. Children who live in a home or an environment that has dirt and animals have much more rich diversity of their microbiomes and less allergies and less autoimmune diseases. An autoimmune disease is one where our body just turns against itself. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Um, fibromyalgia is an autoimmune disease. Um, I'm trying to think of another one. Um, celiac disease, autoimmune disease, where our body just turns on itself. When we have a good microbiome, that fights that. So kids who live in a, a you know, have animals, get the dirt and play, they're going to have less allergies, less autoimmune diseases, less asthma. And pets in the home are associated with a healthier gut microbiome. Because, you know, no matter how hard we try to keep our house clean, you got a dog or a cat or, a, you know, guinea pig, it, you get a little more dirt. So the gut microbiome, also we're calling it the gut microbiota, same thing, um, and diet. So a high fiber diet is the best thing to have good bacteria in our gut. It increases the diversity, the gut microbiome diversity. So we want to have a high fiber diet. Remember, if we don't have fiber, there's nothing for that bacteria to eat. Now, other things that affect our gut microbiome that are in our diet, a high protein, high fat diet gives us a gut microbiome that has a lot of bacterioides. You'll hear it pronounced lots of different ways. I tried to listen to something this morning so I could say it right. I don't know. Everybody says it differently. But these are the bacteria in our gut that are associated with more obesity and more metabolic syndrome. If you're not familiar with metabolic syndrome, that is a cluster of health issues that all increase our risk of having a heart attack. So it could be that we don't have diabetes, but our blood sugars aren't quite well controlled. That we're lean in that way. It can include high blood pressure. It can include um, a weight that we keep around our waist. It can include elevated lipids. So it's a combination of these things and they call it the metabolic syndrome because one thing increases our risk, but having all the things really increases our risk of heart disease. So these bacterioides seem to be associated with higher incidence of extra weight and metabolic syndrome. Also, a high protein, high fat diet tends to have less diversity in our gut, which contributes to all those problems. We have less of those short chain fatty acids, those good byproducts of breaking down our foods. Animal foods also promote growth of the bad bacteria and can create more toxins in our system. So if somebody were to say to you, you know, what's, what should I really avoid to have good gut microbiome? Animal foods, fried foods, fast foods, dairy, cheese, all those are gonna contribute. If we have more bad bacteria than good bacteria, so we're in dysbiosis, we're in imbalance, it damages, like I mentioned before, those little tight junctions in the colon. And so we get a leaky gut. Things leak out into our system and cause damage like inflammation. And those bacterial endotoxins get into that bloodstream and it starts to fire. That's the inflammation, fire. Got all this fire now going on in our system. So we want to have lots of good that are keeping the bad down. And we, I guess there must be some reason why we need to have some of the bad, but the good are supposed to keep it in control. So to maintain our gut health, we have a good healthy microbiome. We need a good diet, and by good, that's diverse. That's lots of different foods, lots of different plant foods, high fiber, plant-based, and we'll have some fermented foods too, if you like that. If you don't, you don't, that's okay. So we want, it's basically the same diet that we talk about every time we talk. So here's just some, 
Medicines Committee for Responsible Medicine. They do a lot. And you could look on their website for more information on that microbiome if you wanted to delve a little bit deeper. But these would be some of those foods that are prebiotic. They have the good bacteria. So no, sorry, probiotic. I get my words confused. Probiotic have the good bacteria. Prebiotics feed the good bacteria. Okay. So the foods here, you know, like broccoli, excellent food. And we all know it. Blueberries, one of the best ones we can have. Some of these you might not know about. Like polenta, that's a cornmeal mush. Miso, that's a fermented food. Now you might say, oh, that miso, it's really high in salt. And you're absolutely right, which is why I don't use it a whole lot. But some of the um, research has said that even though it's high in salt, the benefits of their fermented food outweigh that. And we don't usually use a whole lot. Unless there's your tempeh, that's fermented soybeans. And then up at the top, we've got our legumes or our beans. And then we have at the top right, Jerusalem artichokes. Nothing like an artichoke. I grew these last summer. They didn't come in this summer. But um, they're, they're a, little, a little tuber and they tend to be a strong probiotic. Prebiotic, sorry. Gosh, I'm getting all my words confused. Okay. So how are you gonna build good bacteria in your gut? Well, we wanna build all our meals around plants, whole food, plant-based. Now, I know you don't want one more thing to count, but it's nice to aim for about 50 grams of fiber a day. You know, the typical American gets between like 11 and 15 grams. The recommendation is between 25 and 38 grams, at least. Healthy um, cultures who have very little colon problems and very little disease, are getting upwards of 100 grams a day of fiber in those communities. So aiming for 50 isn't that hard if we're eating the foods that will feed our good bacteria. So if we're eating our whole grains, our fruits and vegetables, our beans and legumes, our nuts and seeds, all those are gonna help. So we can eat plant prebiotics, and there's a list of them. We had some on our last slides too, but just eat a variety of foods. I don't think we need to think, oh my gosh, I always have to eat these. Just get a variety of foods. Add fermented foods if you can and you like them. You know, you'll like that probably like sourdough. Sourdough bread has a bacteria in it to make it grow. And so that's kind of a tasty one. Some of you might like tempeh or kimchi or sauerkraut. Um, kombucha, another little tip on the kombucha, especially for kombucha lovers. It's so acidic, they really recommend you dilute it at least half with water. Um, also avoid red meat, avoid high fat meat, avoid fried foods, avoid dairy, um, and limit your saturated fat, which we're all trying to do for heart health. Oddly, or I guess beneficially, all this stuff helps our heart and helps our gut. And when we help our gut, we help our heart. And I know the diet part probably isn't really anything new that you're not already striving for. A few little things about the gut microbiome and obesity, because this is, I don't know if it's a hot topic, but it's something that comes up. There's more of a obese gut microbiome, like we talked about those bacterioides. I see it spelled differently here. Um, lean, I think I got that confused. Hold that thought because I'm going to have to fix that. The bacterioides and the firmicutes. Obese people have more firmicutes. Sorry about that. I got that mixed up on the other slide. So it seems like people who have the obese gut microbiome because they got a dysbiosis, they tend to be able to get more calories out of their food and maybe have more cravings. So when they've done experiments and they do these things called fecal implants, they actually transfer poop to somebody else. So they do it in mice, it happens in humans now too. But originally they took a germ-free mouse, a mouse that didn't have any bacteria or anything at all. And they implanted them with basically a fecal implant from the obese mice. So they took this guy, the obese mice got the germ-free bacteria and they got higher fat, you know, 
I think last time I did this, I got confused on this too. I went over this so I wouldn't get confused today. If you give a germ-free mouse a fecal implant from an obese mouse, thank you, I just needed to read it. Then what we find is that germ-free mouse who's just skinny and normal, now he gains more total body fat. If you take that germ-free mouse and you give it a fecal implant from a normal weight mouse, they stay normal. Now this is also seen in humans. And so studies kind of look at this yo-yo obesity when sometimes you just keep gaining and losing weight over and over with the gut microbiome because the obese gut microbiome, even if you lose a hundred pounds, has this memory for at least six months after you lose that weight with the bad bacteria. Well, the obese bacteria. So that can make it why it's super hard to lose weight. And obese mice who got fecal implants from normal weight mice, eventually it erased the memory of the bad bacteria or the obese bacteria and they didn't regain weight. But it takes time. It holds on to it for like six months, which is why it's so hard to lose weight and keep it off. Because imagine you have the bacteria that cause you to put on weight and get more calories out of your food and have more cravings. And now you lost this weight, but your body's trying so hard to put it back on. So we just got to keep fighting it. There's no great answer other than keep fighting it. And then one of the best ways to fight it is a whole food plant-based diet. Other things that are looking at the gut microbiome, they're looking at neurological health problems like Parkinson's, um, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, autism could be linked to dysbiosis in our guts. And then those fecal implants have been used to treat some things very effectively, like C. difficile. If you've heard of that, it's a, a GI, it causes chronic diarrhea, it's real hard to get rid of. It's a bad bug. And so fecal implants, giving it an implant from someone who does not have C. diff can get rid of it. Ulcerative colitis, NAFLD is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. And also having dysbiosis or an imbalance in our bacteria in our gut can contribute to some chronic diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, even diabetes. So there's lots of value to having a good, healthy microbiome. Oops, oops, sorry, one more. And dang, I had diabetes. So also it's associated with diabetes. So if we have gut microbiome that is in just imbalance, we make more of this byproduct called acetate. And that acetate tends to be linked with diabetes. I mean, obesity, and then after that, diabetes. So acetate makes your body make more insulin. It increases this hormone called ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone, which makes you hungry. This causes more food intake, causes more insulin resisting, and it leads to type two. And the high fat meals in diabetes, and really in everyone, can lead to these toxins, again, that leak through the intestinal cell wall, the leaky gut. And so now we've got the fire started, we've got inflammation, that can also contribute to high triglycerides and inflammation. So this fiber fuel, this, that's the book I've been telling you about. I mean, I don't know, if, if you're really interested in this topic, you might enjoy the book. Again, I just got it at the library. I thought it was a great read. Um, Will Bolshewitz is his name, he's a doctor, a GI doc. He has, you know, we have all these ways of remembering the things we're supposed to eat. So I thought he had kind of a cute one. It's the F goals. So in order to have good gut health, and remember, good health, good health, gut health translates to less chronic disease, improved diabetes, improved heart health. So the F is for fruit and fermented foods. The G is getting your greens and your grains. The O is for omega-3 kind of super seeds. Our flax, our chia, and our hemp are the seeds that have a lot of omega-3. A, this time you might not have thought of these words, but aromatics. That's like the onions and garlic when you make soup or you make pretty much anything, you start with onions and garlic. 
Now, this might be a new thing to you. And that is that they recommend that when you chop your stuff up, you stop for 10 minutes. And that activates the healthier compounds, more of those phytochemicals that are in those things. There's a, I didn't want to add any more big words, but it, you know, transfers one thing to another. So if you wait 10 minutes, you get more of those. That's something I never really do very much because I'm always at the last minute trying to throw everything in. So if you can plan your cooking about chopping and stopping, not a bad idea. And then L is for legumes, legumes or beans. Um, and then L is for sulforaphane and shrooms. Sorry, no other end. Um, so broccoli sprouts, broccoli has a lot of sulforaphane. That's a phytochemical that's been shown to be super helpful and it's helpful for our gut microbiome too. Broccoli sprouts have 10 to 100 times more sulforaphane than broccoli. Now I'm a broccoli eater. I've also taken to sprouting. I bought some broccoli sprouts, these little tiny seeds um, on Amazon. You put a tablespoon in a little glass jar, you get them wet, you rinse them and drain them twice a day for like three days and you have a whole jar full of sprouts. And then you just throw those on anything you like. So if you like sprouting, great. If you don't, just eat broccoli. And then the cruciferous vegetables that we've talked about before, broccoli, kale, arugula, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels, they're all strong cancer fighters. And mushrooms, I didn't put a dot here, but mushrooms are strong cancer fighters too. So I thought F goals was kind of a fun way to remember the things you're supposed to and so how does this apply? If you're thinking, I'm not going to count all those things. I don't want to do all that. Just the way we generally want to eat, we've got our little plate. This is our plant-based plate. It's called the power plate. It's from Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. It's not unlike the regular plate you're familiar with, but it's got fruits and vegetables. It's got grains. Instead of protein, we got legumes. So if you're thinking, well, I don't know how much to have of all those things, they recommend at least three or more servings of whole grains, whole intact grains. You have oatmeal for breakfast, that's one. You have brown rice for lunch, that's two. You have, um, what's another whole grain? Barley at dinner, or you have um, a whole wheat bread. You got your three servings. Then one to two servings of beans. I'm, I like to have beans at lunch and dinner. Then you get your three to five servings of veggies every day. And then you get two to four servings of fruit every day. Now, I know people with diabetes say, oh my gosh, I can't have that much fruit. But if you're eating fruit in its whole real form, and sometimes we have to budget our carbs a little to make sure the fruit fits in, it's going to be fine for your diabetes. It's not going to jump your blood sugars like if you were drinking juice. But if we did all this, we'd be getting plenty of bacteria plenty of good food to fuel our bacteria in our guts. So it's just another way of thinking about it. So what can you do to have more plant foods? Well, I really encourage you to count all your foods one or two days and see what you're getting. You might already be doing fabulous. Even if you are, it's still nice to spread around the diversity. I feel like I get enough plant-based foods every day. But I don't always do the diversity. I might eat the same thing for three or four days. So I could interchange things a little bit better. So you start where you're at, build from there. Go to the farmer's market. Find what's new and in season. I mean, now we've got so many great summer fruits. You've got your peaches and your nectarines and your plums and your watermelons. You've got all that stuff right now. Try to only have plants on your plate. Fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, legumes, just like our plate. Try to only have plants. Really be liberal with your herbs and spices. And John was mentioning earlier today that you have to be really brave about your spices. You gotta really load up on things in order for some of our foods to, to really taste good because we're eating lower fat and fat tastes good. So you gotta really spice things up. So be liberal, be daring, try some new things. Maybe we could add veggies to breakfast, I don't know. I know a lot of people who have spinach or greens in with their oatmeal. I have not yet, but I'll put some greens into a smoothie in the morning, or I'll have a tofu scramble with some veggies. Have a salad at lunch and dinner. You know, if that's not your main dish, you could also just have a big, huge salad and pile on the veggies. Try to push the animal foods out 
and fill up with the plant foods. So it's about substitution. So instead of the meat, maybe you're having beans. And then add fermented foods where you can and where you enjoy them. I've been working on that with my tank. So I will, um, I'll take off the slides in a minute, but my dishes and Linda made them all pretty when she sent her a recipe. I have a rainbow salad and I have a watermelon gazpacho. To be perfectly honest, I'm not a lover of cold soup. So this was, I really stepped out in order to increase my diversity today. So the watermelon gazpacho is a cold soup. And I mean, I like cold soup when it's just the fruit. But this one is a savory and sweet, which I thought I wasn't sure I was gonna love it, but I gotta say, I liked it. So I've got eight different plant foods in that. So it's the watermelon, but then I also added the cucumber, garlic, onion, some lime, um, basil. I didn't do the jalapeno today because I wasn't sure how I would like that. And then pepper, so eight plant foods. And then the rainbow salad, it has mangoes in it, carrots, I used the red cabbage, arugula, although I used the mixed greens today. Um, my husband doesn't particularly love the arugula. It's got a little bitter taste to it. Green onions, blueberries, it's supposed to be raspberries, but oops, I got the blackberries instead. I forgot which it was. And those are in season and in our little strawberry stands right now. Peanuts, which also happen to be a legume and lime. So nine different plant foods. So, and I actually thought, both of these were pretty good. I haven't put the salad together. I was going to wait for y'all to do that. But I also thought, well, what if you don't know how to cut, cut a mango? So I actually forgot to get the mango at the store. So I ended up using frozen. So on the left here, if you've never cut a mango, some people are really intimidated by it. It's actually not hard. It just takes a minute. But mango is a bit of an oblong shaped fruit. And it's got an oblong pit right in the middle. So it creates kind of on the sides two, I like to call them cheeks, like two cheeks. So here they show you cut off the end. You, and actually I never cut off the end, but I see they do. And then you cut both cheeks off. And then what you're left with is the oblong, um, the oblong pit. And then I just hold that cheek, each cheek in my hand. And then I take my knife and I serrate it diagonally and then turn it inside out. And I've got all these little squares. And then I slice those off. Super easy. Now the recipe today, it's supposed to be rainbow, like cut like little strips. So you could also do that. What they say you do is you take your mango and you peel it, which to me is not a super easy thing to do. And then you score it all the way around and then dig out your little strip. So that's how they did it. I just use frozen. Frozen mango, I think is one of the best things because you can't always find mangoes at the right price or at the right season. And the frozen ones are excellent. Always at the peak, I would have to say. They come in cubes. So I just kind of slice my cubes. But also frozen mango is really good to make like a nice cream that you do with banana. Do that with mangoes. It's really excellent. And you could also just make a sorbet, which I guess is nice. So bottom line, to have a health gut microbiome, you can have, if you have one, it has good effects on your health, on your immune system, and even your mood. So remember, we've got kind of a cord between our gut and our brain, so it helps us to have good mood. Plant diversity is the key to having a healthy gut. So variety and diversity. Feed good food to your gut, and it's going to take care of you. And good food is fiber food. So as a whole, we're trying to eat whole foods, trying to get away from processed foods. So if, the more you do that, the better it is for your gut. Um, eat a wide variety of plants. Think about those F goals if you like, if that's fun for you to remember. I actually, I like those kind of things. Um, instead of having one superfood, I think this is an interesting concept. Instead of one superfood, eat a variety of a bunch of different foods. Because people say, what's the best food? Well, blueberries would be at the top of the list a lot of times, but don't eat just blueberries. Have a few blueberries, but then also have your raspberries and your blackberries and your strawberries and your watermelon. So don't just focus on a superfood. Superfoods are great, but you need diversity. 
our gut microbiome isn't going to be better because we only eat a superfood. Um, choose less animal foods and fats. Push those out with your plant foods. Only use antibiotics when absolutely necessary, which I think most of us know and realize. Get a pet if you want to and get dirty. Like it's okay to get out there and get dirty a little bit. One thing I want to say about the antibiotics, because this is one thing I've learned recently that is different than what I've said in the past. And that is generally people, if they have to be on antibiotics for a while, will say, okay, well, you need to take a probiotic to help because the antibiotics are going to kill the good and the bad to so take a probiotic so we can get some more of that good bacteria, right? I mean, we probably all heard that. Well, apparently there's been a study in the last few years that has said that if you do take a probiotic when you're doing antibiotics, it actually slows down the time it takes for your gut to heal from the antibiotics which is totally new to me. I, it's the total opposite of what I've always learned and know. But apparently the newer science is showing that now that they can look at the gut microbiome and see those things. So don't automatically take a probiotic just because you're taking antibiotics. Eat plant foods. That's going to heal it faster, eating your whole plant foods. So I thought that was interesting. So we're going to eat healthy, live healthy, be healthy. Love that. I'm going to show you my dishes right now. I've kind of really just pre-prepped all of them. I'm not gonna really be cooking anything, but I wanna show you a few gadgets. So I'm stopping my sharing. I'm gonna turn my thing around so you can see. I'm also gonna tilt down a little bit. Can you see all my little props there? The carrots front and center. What? The carrots right in the middle. Is that a carrot? Yes. Yeah, that's a carrot. That's to show you one of my um, little fun tools I like. Okay. Well, while I'm here, oh, I left this out to show everybody in case, I don't know if you can read it. It's my new mug. It says grandma bear because I'm going to be a grandma for the mm -hmm. first time. My husband's older daughter's pregnant, so we're super excited about a new baby in December. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, I'll admit, I really don't like kids all that much, but I'm really looking forward to this one. I think everybody says grandkids are the best. We'll see. Where do they live? They live in Sacramento. Okay. So hopefully we're going to be a part of it. Right. Okay. I'm going to start here with my soup. So gazpacho typically has a tomato base. I'm sure you're familiar. And it's a savory thing. So you got tomatoes and onions and garlic and all kinds of things. I mean, I, I like it. Okay. But it's not something I generally choose. So I was going out of my way to for diversity today for the watermelon. So this just called for a bunch of watermelon. And then it did call for onions and garlic and cucumbers. Again, I mentioned the jalapeno, I didn't throw that in there. And then you blend all that up. So I blended it. It came out a little watery and I'm afraid it might be because what I did on 4th of July, I, was, I did a fruit salad for our, the party. And I was doing watermelon balls. If you've ever done melon balls, you know, there's lots of parts that get wasted because they don't form a perfect ball. So I saved the little chunks and I saved the juice and froze it because I knew I was going to be doing this soup later. And I think it might be a little more watery than normal. But what I like that makes it crunchy is that they have you blend it all up and then you save some chunks of watermelon and some chunks of cucumber. And then you just combine it all. So it is a little bit, hoping you can see it. I mean, it's super pretty. And I will say I tasted it and it actually tastes really good. A little sweet, a little savory. I think it's a nice summer dish. And if you think, oh, I don't really know if I want to mix my sweet and my savory, then don't. Just use straight watermelon. There's plenty of recipes out there that are watermelon soup that just use straight watermelon. But a lot of times the people on the you know little comments will say, well, it just tastes like watermelon soup, nothing special. So this really does make it a bit special. So I don't know, I like that. I think that's a good one for a cool summer night or I'm having it for lunch. I'll see if my husband likes it, I don't know. 
Now, the next one is my rainbow salad. So it started, it calls for arugula. You just put that in your bowl. I, I have, I at least half the recipe, if not quarter. But I put a little of my just mixed greens because as I mentioned, we don't get a lot of arugula around here. And then it calls for our cab red cabbage, which I just sliced a little and it comes out in little strips. So you add a little of that. I think the nice thing about putting this together is you can put in as much of a ratio of everything as you want. So you can have it be more of this, less of this, doesn't matter. Then it calls for carrots, like little strips. Now, a while ago, I showed you about my um, spiralizer, but I also have a little um, peeler that makes strips. And I don't know actually if every peeler would do this. This one is a little wider, so it will actually make strips when I do it. So this is one of my little gadgets. You can also do it with your zucchini and it comes out a little thicker, but you kind of mix in. So now look, I got more color in there. So, and I like my little peeler. And then, oh, I got my mango. So here's my frozen mango. They were just little cubes. And then I just sliced them up so that they'd be a little bit more like strip. And then it called for some green onion. Nothing special about that. And as if we haven't had enough food, it all up. Now we got berries. So this has got a few blueberries, a few, few blackberries. The blackberries are so amazing right now, especially when we get them. And when they, I think they say they're plastic grown, but they're not grown on the little bushes that I see around here because those things are so small this year. So I, they must be somewhere in plastic grown. So now what a great variety we have here. I'm going to eat that berry. Now, another thing I like about this recipe is it calls for the zest of a lime. And you add that, it's not in the dressing. So often the zest goes in the dressing. So I just, in case you don't have a microphone, this is one of my favorite tools. You take your lemon, lime, orange, and you just grate it like that. And it creates zest. I love this. So then I'm gonna take my this and sprinkle it in. I think that's going to really make the flavor pop. And then the dressing could not be simpler. It was the juice from my lime. And in case you don't have one of these, this is another one of my favorite gadgets. It's actually a lemon squeezer, but I use it for limes too. They make a special one for lime. I found that it works fine. So you cut your lemon or lime or orange in half. You do need a little bigger one for an orange. And you turn it face down, which is the opposite of what you think. And then you press it. It's good for your arm muscles too. And then it squeezes up. Now you got lime juice. I love that. You could also buy just a little jars of, of lime juice. I don't know, lately all my recipes seem to call for lime juice. So it's lime juice, seasoned rice vinegar. This is the vinegar that's got rice vinegar, but it's got a little sugar in it. And then hot sauce. It calls for like two tablespoons of each of these. I think it's two tablespoons of everything. I just used a little dash of hot sauce. But the dressing ended up being pretty good. And then you just pour that on. Now I cut my recipe, so I'm not gonna use all of it. And then I'm gonna top that, as if we don't have enough plant food, with some peanuts, a legume. We got pretty much everything on our list in here. I guess I didn't use any fermented food, but we use greens, we use fruit. Uh, we could, yeah, we could sprinkle some pumpkin, some chia seeds or something on there and that would give it our omega-3s. And it has our aromatics, our onion. How about your, your broccoli sprouts? Yes, thank you very much. In fact, I got a bag of broccoli sprouts because I thought, if people think this is just way too much work and they don't want to cut this, just use your broccoli sprout. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. That's my recipe. Cool. I'm gonna, um, I think it's fun to try to have a little bite of every single thing. You get it, there's too many.
It's good. I love wine. Uh, and I just use a little basket. It's not quite a good gift. But yeah, I think that's good. That's going to be a, I think that's a keeper, that recipe. I think this wouldn't be a good one to take to a papa. And you just assemble it all there or have it all set up and people can put what they want in. So I had two questions. I can remember one of them. Okay. And the first one was about, you mentioned when you are breastfed that you have more, you get more bacteria, you know, from, from early onset, but if it changes a lot, how long does it, you actually keep all that? Or is it? Oh, you know? I think it just gives, you know, and I guess I'm not really quite sure the answer, but I think it just gives you a healthy base because you're right. Your, your gut microbiome changes all the time, depending on what you're eating, depending on the dirt, depending on everything. So I think it just helps you during that period of time, but it does change really quickly. You're right. As they learned from that study, when they gave people plant foods, it was better, you know, right away. So. I think when you're bred, the whole time you're breastfeeding, you're getting those good bacteria. And breast milk has a lot of those in it. Right. Okay. And then I can't remember the second question. I did get that book you mentioned last time. So that's in our library at Folsom Hall when people come back if they oh, want to borrow it awesome. there. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I have a question about fiber, and I know it's best to get it from natural foods, but you see these ads all over for, you know, artificial fiber, I call it artificial fiber, fiber and pills. Do they help? You know, they are beneficial because they are fiber. So like the, even Metamucil is fiber. So, and it's a soluble fiber, and it actually can help lower your cholesterol just like oats do. But you really don't need it if we're eating foods like this. If we have a good plant-based diet, you don't need to spend money on it. But does it hurt if you if you don't have as much of a plant-based diet as one would like? No, no, it doesn't hurt. I go more instead of the like pills. I I go with like the Metamucil because it is just basically psyllium seed, which is a soluble fiber seed. Okay, thank you. And what what's the thing about sourdough? Because I've well, heard sourdough it has a little bacteria. So, you know, the history of sourdough is, yeah, you know, it ferments. And that's if you've ever had, and I bet you have, you know, a sourdough starter and it picks up the bacteria from the air or wherever it's at. And that's why the San Francisco sourdough might taste different than the Boston sourdough. So, it's just got bacteria in it. So, it gives you a few more bugs. So, even the commercial sourdough? Helps because uh -huh. I've heard that yeah, I used to make sourdough bread myself for a long time, had a hundred year old starter, and that's gone by the wayside. But I've heard that the sourdough that you get commercially is not as um, beneficial as obviously starting it from scratch. And yeah, I have another it, question after this one. It's all right. I would, I would agree, it probably isn't, but it's still sourdough, so it still had a bacteria. Where does citrus like lemon and uh, uh, particularly lemon and orange fall into the fiber category, or does it? Oh, yeah, they're, they're good. Well, you know, they have all the little pulp and stuff. They're good. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure how much in each serving, you know, probably at least a couple of grams, I would guess. Yeah, I didn't see them on your list of, of fiber things, so that's why I asked. Oh, yeah, that was not an exhaustive list. So okay. I'm sure there any plant food is going to be good. Thank you very much. It was Thank very you. interesting. Anything else? You start your exercise at 115 now? Correct. Okay. Debbie? Yes. I have a question. I, I put it in chat. Oh, gosh. When you, know, when... Anyway. On cancer fighting foods, is that like to prevent cancer or is it like if you have cancer or? It's to prevent. Or if you have cancer, I mean, it can help be a treatment, but it's to prevent a recurrence. So when you see cancer fighting foods, they are ideally to prevent it. But if we have cancer, we still want to eat cancer fighting foods because they keep. They help us with our healing, but also to prevent, uh, 
future cancer. And then my other question, um, on the fresh fruits and vegetables, if you don't eat them right away, I mean, and, I mean, do they lose potency? Were they still healthy or, or yes, nutritious rather? Be, but you're right. Oh, some of the nutrients we lose to heat or light or air. But that doesn't mean they're going to lose all of it and be completely not full of nutrients. But yeah, we do lose a little bit. All right, thank you. Okay. So we call it.